Great Disasters and Horrors in the World's History by Alan H. Godby. Preface. Whatever be the ideas of the public upon a glance at the title page of this work, it is not intended to pander to the morbid desire for the sensational or horrible characteristic of weak minds. This volume is not a literary morgue. Mankind is constantly astonished by reports of mishaps and disasters of manifold character, when there is seldom room for astonishment. A large proportion of the calamities reported from day to day are directly due to the haste, greed, and heedlessness of man himself, and need no comment. But there is a large class of disasters due solely to meteorological or geological conditions which surpass all others in magnitude and appalling destruction. In such cases, men insist on prating about mysterious visitations, as though these occurrences were subject to the dominion of no law. To an examination of such is this book devoted. When in school, the writer was often struck by the persistence with which even the most diligent students would call upon the teachers of physics and chemistry to suspend the recitation and devote the time to illustrative experiments. Physical geography was constantly pronounced very dry because of the scarcity of opportunities for illustration. The writer has endeavored to present, in a form acceptable to the popular palate, the general principles of the storm and earthquake so far as they are understood, and numerous narratives of great disturbances have been inserted that a clearer conception of the magnitude of these agencies and their relative importance may be attained by the reader. Much care has been spent in steering between Scylla and Charybdis. While it has been designed to avoid merely scientific data, there has been the equally delicate task of avoiding prolix narration and mere sensational tales. It is hoped that the result will be useful and interesting. If the book shall lead the reader to higher views of the reign of inexorable law in nature and to a profounder reverence for the author of law and his works, the labor of its compilation will not have been spent in vain. A. H. Godby End of Preface Great Disasters and Horrors in the World's History by Alan H. Godby Chapter 6 Incidents of the Tornado O oh, cold and savage wind! It racks my soul to hear the wild lamenting of wounded hearts whose grief knows no relenting. Can not their woe e'er sway thee to repenting, O cold and savage wind? O melancholy wind, hast thou no requiem for the dead and dying? Art thou some fierce despairing spirit sighing, or a lost paradise behind thee lying, O melancholy wind? Too frequently in the confusion of great disasters, the woes of the poorer classes are forgotten in the attention given to their more opulent neighbors. There is only too often good cause given for a slight modification of Shylock's speech. Hath not a Jew eyes, etc.? There is no sadder record than that so frequently given in a single line. Dead, a woman, name unknown. What fearful heartaches often end in the potter's field. Adjoining the Louisville Hotel was a saloon and cigar store, the rooms over which were occupied by the hotel laundry girls. These were hurled into the cellar and so tightly wedged that death could not have been long delayed. One was found sitting upright, the pallor of death on her face and agony in every feature. 
another lay upon her back with hands outstretched above her head as though she tried to thrust destruction back a third was sitting dead while nearby another lay upon her face as though refusing to behold that which she could not shun nor you ye proud impute to these the fault if memory o'er their tomb no trophies raise where through the long-drawn aisle in fretted vault the pealing anthem swells the note of praise poor laundry girls let their dead dust be mentioned with reverence had they been spoiled daughters of wealth and fashion press reporters would have waxed eloquent of their birth their history their beauty their accomplishments their heritage we should have heard in detail the names of their wealthy and mourning friends and of their impressive obsequies magnificent monuments would have risen to mark their sleeping dust these five laundry girls were taken up tenderly and two or three days later together borne without pomp to humble graves but is not honest industry and useful avocation toiling for bread a more royal thing than silks and diamonds bedizening frivolity and idleness is there not in america many a haughty heiress less worthy of our tears than these let not ambition mock their useful toil their homely joys and destiny obscure and when we say peace to their ashes will not the reader add a fervent amen on seventeenth street was a pathetic sight one blackened and charred wall stood swaying in the wind just over the door was a sign plain sewing an old woman had been the sole tenant here any day for years past it may be with fingers weary and worn with eyelids heavy and red a woman sat in unwomanly rags plying her needle and thread stitch 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 in poverty hunger and dirt and still with a voice of dolorous pitch she sang the song of the shirt her charred body was dug from beneath the ruins tragic end of a life of poverty and toil but when we reflect on the lot of many another sewing woman who still survives we may with solomon feel inclined to praise the dead who are already dead more than the living who are yet alive about thirteenth and walnut dwelt a peddler with wife and child he knocked a hole in the side wall of his wrecked home and dragged out his little family over a seemingly impassable pile of debris then he thought of another woman and two helpless children imprisoned upstairs he rushed to their rescue and dragged them out just in time to save them from the flames which two minutes later were licking up all that would burn society must think more of its lonely toilers even of its peddlers and publicans and sinners it was the keeper of a brothel in memphis who during the awful yellow fever visitation turned her house into a hospital and ministered to the suffering till she fell a victim herself jesus was looking at some very nice people when he said the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of god before you to those good people such a thing would be one of the mysteries of providence mysteries of providence are continually ferreted out on such occasions reporters to whom everything that can be written is news gather up a hundred items and give them to the public often grouping items in a manner that is strikingly grotesque there is no grimmer humor than the apparently matter-of-fact statement that during a great italian earthquake wherein lofty cathedrals were shaken to pieces and hundreds of people killed statues of the virgin escaped uninjured sober-minded people are prone to wonder what is the relative value of a human life and a graven image one might if such things were of constant occurrence consider them as meant by providence as a very sarcastic punishment for the violation of the second commandment it is related that at the time of the massacre of saint bartholomew a romish captain secured a number of fugitives among whom he felt satisfied there were some good catholics not being able to distinguish them readily he referred the perplexing case to a fanatical priest the response came promptly kill all the lord will know his own interpreters 
of the inscrutable ways of providence might find such the only solution for many particulars of the storm the pious but superstitious folk who believe that all such visitations are for the sins of a people instead of the result of laws that send the rain alike upon the just and the unjust might find some perplexity in conning the following cases on the next street back of fall city hall stood the st john's episcopal church the rector with his little four-year-old boy was in the study the rectory and the church were completely destroyed and the rector and his child were killed in an adjoining building ten or eleven men were playing cards the house was demolished but not one of the players was seriously hurt the preacher perished the idlers were saved herein is food for reflection tierney saloon was on eleventh between main and market the icebox saved him and four other men from being crushed they crowded beside it and crawled out uninjured the pastor and the useful laundry girls perished the saloon keeper and his patrons survived the catholic buildings at seventeenth and broadway were father desney's residence the sisters home the church of the sacred heart and the parochial school all these were wrecked by the wind and sister pious was killed there is a story that amid utter ruin the image of the virgin was left standing untouched by harm let the devout remember that a saloon keeper obtained an equal deliverance Elmer Barnes and several others ran into Eckerly's saloon, 1001 West Market, and securely closed the door. The building fell with a crash, and the men were buried in the ruins. Barnes and Eckerly were overwhelmed by the falling bricks and timber. Eckerly was fearfully injured. Barnes was drawn from the ruins and died a few hours afterward. The other men were only slightly hurt. If we have had occasion to mention the destruction of one church and of several saloons, it is probably only because saloons are more numerous than churches. At a grocery store at the corner of 16th and Magazine Streets, the owner and five others were standing at the bar in the back part of the store. A dreadful roaring sound was heard, and the house rocked back and forth. The owner's wife and children screamed and ran out the back way. Almost instantly the rear wall of the building fell. The six men rushed to escape by the front door, but the wind closed it with such force that it could not be opened. The floor beneath gave way, and three men were dropped into the cellar and pinned among the ruins. The other three escaped through a side window. Instantly a fire kindled and took hold on the imprisoned men. Their cries were awful, while their escaped companions witnessed the horrible cremation and were powerless to render aid. We record but a few of the multitude of deaths, experiences, incidents, and escapes. Doubtless, there is many an untold tale, something of personal interest connected with almost every one of the hundreds of buildings, partially or wholly wrecked. The press at first exaggerated, and perhaps finally minimized, the loss of life. There is reason to think that not all the names of the dead were given to the public, while subsequently several died of their wounds. To the list of those who were killed outright or died in a few hours, better information might have added several names and possibly subtracted or corrected others. The public may find in the press reports lists of the dead and numerous records of persons injured or killed by the fallings of walls or by flying missiles, but these, after all, must be regarded as exceptions. There can be no very correct estimate of the number of people who were in the downtown district at the time of the accident. Yet it would be safe to say only a very small portion of those in the path of the storm suffered any injury. That a storm of such magnitude and fury would have swept through the heart of a city of 200,000 people to destroy outright no more than five or six score lives may excite our wonder. The most obvious reason of the low mortality will be found in the hour and place of the principal visitation. The place was the business part of the city, and the hour between 8 and 9 p.m. 
when the wholesale houses and the streets in their vicinity were comparatively deserted. Another fact is also to be noted. The cyclone seems to have reached the ground scarcely at any point at all. Its principal fury was probably expended in the region above the housetops. The roofs and tops of walls were removed. The damage below resulted principally from their fall. Humbler buildings sheltering human lives were sometimes crushed by the fall of the upper portion of the wall of some contiguous building, as notably in the case of the house occupied by the laundry girls and which was smashed by the fall of the wall from the top story of the Louisville Hotel or the case of a colored family whose house was crushed by the wall of the Falls City Hall. But in any case of cyclonic visitation, the escapes will probably amaze us more than the deaths, for when it will seem that nothing living could have escaped, the majority will not only probably be found alive, but absolutely unhurt. Of numerous cases, a few specimens will suffice. Peter, Speth, and family were seated in the parlor when the cyclone arrived. The family huddled together in the hall, doubtless to avail themselves of the protection of the side walls not far apart. The walls of the second story fell in with a crash. The building and furniture were destroyed, but the family escaped without injury. Eleven men were in a barber shop at 1803 Broadway. The roof was blown off. The walls fell in but all the men escaped through the windows without a scratch. At 329 11th Street, on the upper floor of a two-story brick, a lady lay at the point of death, watched by her son and daughter. She begged them to flee for their lives, but they refused to forsake her. The roof was stripped clean off, but the devoted children with their mother escaped injury. In one cottage on Chapel Street dwelt a family of five, at once, all were in the house when the storm demolished it and four escaped unhurt. Major Galt of the Louisville and Nashville Road lived in a two-story brick. He apprehended no danger till the walls fell. His wife was buried under a pile of bricks. Her husband, with difficulty, extricated her and carried her unconscious to the house of a neighbor. Save for the shock, she was not seriously hurt. Now, were such cases the exception, had not such instances happened in a hundred other places similarly visited, there would certainly be cause for perplexity. But the phenomena of the Louisville storm tend only to establish the truth of a fact long suspected, that the most destructive effects of a tornado are not always attributable to the direct force of the wind, a number of interesting incidents of the Louisville storm will serve to illustrate a now clearly established fact. Mrs. Fitzpatrick and her family were in a two-story brick, 1433 17th Street. They were all in an upper room and could not get out. The walls fell outward, while the floor still remained in its place. They climbed down unhurt. James Smith, colored, lived with his wife and seven children in Congress Alley in the rear of Falls City Hall. Himself, his wife, and three children were crushed beneath the massive bricks and timbers. The remaining four children were taken out more dead than alive. Yet, the house was not in the least moved from its place. The building was crushed by the wall of the hall, which fell outward. Similar was the fate of the laundry girls. The house in which they were was crushed by the top of the wall of the Louisville Hotel, which fell outward toward the wind. The colored odd fellows were holding a meeting in their hall at 13th and Walnut. The two upper stories were blown entirely down. Several large circular holes were blown through the brick walls, one of these in the side away from the storm. Several received more or less injury, but not one was fatally hurt. At 1315 18th Street was a magnificent new brick cottage. The roof remained, but in the west wall were made six holes, round as a dollar, and large enough to admit a flour barrel. It is added that the missing bricks were nowhere to be found. Finally, take the experience of a grocer on West Market Street. 
I was inside of my store, and my clerk was there too. Standing on the pavement outside were policeman Harlow, a man named Charles Taylor, who said he lived in Jeffersonville, a Negro whose name I do not know, and Carl Rice, an eight-year-old boy who lived with his parents in the rooms above my store. When the wind grew high and the hail began to pelt, Mr. Harlow attempted to open the front door of the store, which was closed, to come inside for shelter. At that moment, the tornado came in all its fury. No one who is not in it can conceive of its terrific force. The suction from without, as the full force came, was so great that it was impossible to get the front door open. My clerk at work on it on the inside and Mr. Harlow on the outside were as powerless against the wind as babies would have been in attempting to move a stone wall. But their efforts were not of long duration. The tornado forced its way in the rear of the upper stories of my building, and with impetuosity unequaled, forged through the apartments against the front wall. This wall popped out and fell to the pavement below, upon those standing there, burying them in the debris. The front is entirely gone, as you see. Mr. Harlow and the little boy Carl Rice were close up to the front door, and only a small portion of the wall struck them. Taylor and the Negro were out on the pavement further, and they fared worse. Taylor's leg was broken at the ankle, and he was internally injured. The Negro had a hole knocked in his skull larger than a silver dollar, and was used up generally. Mr. Harlow was bruised, but fortunately has no bones broken and is not dangerously hurt. The little boy's head was pretty badly cut and bruised, but he is not in a serious condition. Now in all of these cases is noticeable the same peculiar feature of walls falling outward, sometimes even against the wind, or of holes being burst in walls, the bricks being thrown so far that they could not be found or distinguished from those of other houses. This might seem inexplicable that the windward walls often fall outward, but it must be remembered that all storms with a wind system blowing spirally upward and inward are characterized by low barometer, signifying a diminution in atmospheric pressure at the storm center, and the lower the barometer, the more violent the storm. Now it is clear that if a storm advance slowly and be widely diffused, the air in the regions through which it moves has time to accommodate itself gradually to the change, and expanding slowly to equalize the pressure in all directions, its rarefaction is not perceptible to the ordinary observer, and the denser air within a dwelling expands so gradually that all the surplus can escape through chinks and crevices if the doors and windows be closed but the narrow path tornado comes so rapidly as to produce little atmospheric change beforehand, while directly at its center the barometer may stand as much as two inches lower than in the surrounding region. Now a fall of two inches means, in round numbers, a lessening of pressure of one pound to every square inch, or 144 pounds to the square foot. As the air normally presses equally in all directions, the passage of a storm of this sort may mean a sudden change from 15 pounds pressure to the inch on each side of a wall to 15 pounds on the inside and 14 only on the outside. When such a sudden change is brought to bear on every square inch of the interior of a house, it necessarily amounts to an explosion. Suppose that in the case of the door which the men were unable to open, that the pressure had been as great as one pound to the inch, then, an ordinary seven-by-three door would be held in place by a force of a ton and a half. This same power has been observed to burst the weatherboarding from frame houses, leaving the frame and inner surfaces intact. The reader will wonder why, in such cases, the windows do not burst out, leaving the walls unhurt. This often occurs. But very great pressure would evidently act just as does powder in a blast. The rock is rent ere the tamping is torn out, though the latter has far less resistive power, while very violent explosives do not even need any tamping in order to utilize their force. It would seem, then, that a house with open doors and windows has a better chance of weathering a tornado, whether in respect to direct impact of wind or to the expansive force of air within, than a house which is shut up. Here again, 
Quite a number of instances can be adduced of houses caught suddenly thus by tornadoes and escaping unhurt, while houses upon either side were demolished. But that the direct force of the wind on the Louisville occasion was very great is abundantly evidenced. Numerous are the apparently curious freaks that were noticed. A city paper, four days after the storm, contained the following. There are hundreds of the most interesting and miraculous incidents connected with the tornado, showing the queerest sort of freaks of the wind. A block of iron casting, weighing over 150 pounds, was blown into the second story of the Chesapeake, Ohio, and Southern Railway Building, near the Union Depot. Nobody knows where it came from, and the nearest building from which it could have come is nearly 100 yards away. Great sheets of tin roofing were dropped upon Dr. Berry's farm near Turner Station, 40 miles from the city, on the short line. In the ruins of a house on West Main Street, a clock was found clinging to the wall. It was a large office clock, but no one in the vicinity had ever seen it before, and no one knows where it came from. It was badly broken, but the hand still pointed to 8.20 p.m. A large slab of marble was found in a residence on West Madison Street, which was never there before. It will weigh over 100 pounds. At Baird's Drug Store on Market Above Ninth, two bird cages with the birds were blown in through the skylight. The cages were not injured, and the birds are as full of song as ever. When the building occupied by Brand and Bethel, the tobacco men of Green Street went to pieces. A portion of the framework dropped through the roof of a little cottage just east of the factory. It consisted of a heavy timber, to which were mortised four upright pieces of timber. When this came through the cottage, the family were sitting around the table in the dining room, and the four uprights simply pinned them in, but did not hurt them in the least. It was one of the most wonderful escapes yet heard of. To the unexperienced reader, some of these items seem almost apocryphal. But when it is remembered that a tallow candle may be shot through a deal board, or that an ox may be killed by a putty ball fired from a gun, or that a revolver loaded with water instead of ball is a deadly weapon, it will not seem preposterous that a cage may be hurled through a skylight without seriously discommoding the birds. The writer has seen soft pine shingles driven endwise through oak boards an inch thick by a Missouri tornado. Other similar cases might be given. The carrying of objects to a distance depends as much on the upward current as the horizontal motion. One of the simplest illustrations of the inevitable spiral course that an upward or downward current pursues may be seen in the ordinary wash bowl with hole in the bottom. As soon as the plug is drawn and the water commences to pour out, it begins to assume a spiral course, and long before the water is out, there is a circular hole in the fluid reaching to the bottom of the basin. This last illustrates also that the air is rarest at the center of the storm. Pouring liquids through a funnel will show the same spiral tendency. So an object borne away by a tornado rises in curves much like those of a hawk or eagle in flying. Other peculiar feats of the wind were noticed. Some persons caught by the storm had no especial trouble in keeping on their feet, while others were knocked about severely. One man was killed by having his throat cut by a piece of flying glass. A frame house standing near the corner of 18th and Maple was shot full of holes by flying bricks from another house a hundred yards away. A lady standing in the doorway was picked up by the wind and hurled against a telegraph pole at a distance of 60 feet. Another lady and her nephew, at the first shock, rushed into the street. They were caught up by the wind and hurled some distance against a fence. They were found unconscious and both badly hurt. A frame house on 16th Street looked as if it had suffered bombardment. Holes were cut in the weatherboarding by planks evidently driven through the air endwise, and pieces several feet long had penetrated and stuck hard and fast. The building of the Louisville City Railway at 12th and Jefferson Streets was scooped through the middle while the ends were left standing. This was perhaps due to the explosive force of the air within. 
which burst out the weaker portions. In a building of any considerable length, the points most easily overthrown by lateral pressure would naturally be found in the middle portions of the longer walls. At a stone yard on Walnut, between 13th and 14th, the immense iron traveler, with its locomotive, the whole weighing many tons, mounted on an elevated track and used for transferring immense blocks of stone from one side of the yard to the other, was blown into the street and smashed to pieces, while close by, three small brick buildings in one frame were left unharmed. Such cases show how the larger obstacles caused the storm to somewhat overleap the smaller ones, producing the jumping motion mentioned before. The narrow path of the storm may be judged from the fact that no small portion of the good people of Louisville were not aware of the ruinous tempest till they read of its deeds in the morning papers. The total damage done to property is estimated at $2 million. Much the heaviest loss was among the great tobacco warehouses. There has been some discussion as to whether any sort of buildings are safe in a storm. But so long as the most violent tropical cyclones leave many houses unhurt after a protracted gale, there is little fear that the walls of our large buildings may not readily be made massive enough to withstand any atmospheric storms. The chief damage done to business houses was along Main, Jefferson, and Walnut Streets, the damage to dwellings being greatest along Broadway. The havoc on all the crossings in the limits of the tornado was remarkable. It was observed that the buildings on the north sides of the streets parallel to the river suffered most. These more nearly faced the advancing storm, while the open street in front of them gave the wind an increased advantage. This will be better comprehended if the reader will recollect that the tornado of the northern hemisphere rotates in a direction contrary to the hands of a watch. So in the case of one moving eastward or northeastward, the wind on the front edge is blowing directly northward or northwestward. So the current, slightly broken in passing through a block, regains its strength somewhat in slanting across the next street and assaults the next block with renewed force. Louisville, though the principal sufferer by the storm, was not the first. The tornado formed some distance to the southwest of the city and on its devastating march toward Louisville, mowed clean a wide swath through the woods and fell upon the beautiful suburb of Parkland. The mayor's two-story brick residence parted with its roof at the first shock. The mayor's wife was upstairs in bed, ill of pneumonia. Her husband and another man seized the bed and carried her into the yard. Scarcely was this accomplished when the full force of the storm prostrated the building. It may be noticed in this connection that the most destructive wind is never in the first shock, the parting gust being usually the most damaging. Doubtless this is because the expansion of the atmosphere within the house at the moment, the center of calm passes over it, weakens the building to such an extent that the rear of the tornado, striking the house from the opposite direction, readily overthrows it. No such peculiarity is observable in a forest. The trees, containing no vast quantities of air, are usually felled by the first stroke, if at all. The track of the storm through Parkland was one-eighth of a mile wide. From the rate at which it spread, it is clear it could be but short-lived. Within its path, it was more destructive in Parkland than in Louisville. The frame schoolhouse was lifted from its foundation, carried a few feet away, and then torn to fragments. The Daisy Line Depot was totally demolished. The Masonic Temple parted with its upper story. Thirteen houses in the village were completely wrecked, and several others more or less damaged. It will be remembered that in Louisville the upper stories suffered most, but here the storm was fresh, and almost every building struck was raised to the ground. The total damage was about $20,000. Passing through Louisville and crossing the river, the cyclone struck Jeffersonville on the Indiana side. Here, upwards of 80 houses were seriously damaged and quite a number totally destroyed. Two days later, the press gave the loss at $500,000.
probably a great exaggeration, as the particulars given did not tally at all with the general statement. Singularly enough, not a life was lost, and only one or two persons were materially injured. The damage was mostly to roofs and top stories, and the people were doubtless indoors and below. This, however, does not account for the deliverance of a number of persons in buildings which were completely destroyed. Possibly some of these may be accounted for by sudden explosions of buildings, such as has been noticed heretofore. The fragments would be much more apt to injure persons just outside than those within. The largely increased percentage of damage done to roofs and upper stories only shows how rapidly the storm was weakening. It could not go very much farther with its devastation. The old orphan's home was wrecked, one old lady injured, a pastor's house demolished, while two men in the upper story in some mysterious way escaped unhurt. At the foot of Front Street, a shanty occupied by a man with wife and three children was lifted bodily and thrown into the river. The family would have been drowned had not some car works employees rescued them at the peril of their own lives. A number of guests and some who came for shelter were in a house at the corner of First and Spring Streets. The shock of the tornado was followed by a hail of bricks and tumbling walls, but no one of the entire assembly was seriously hurt. The average American worships no god but mammon. He may go to church and bow his head to Jehovah, but it is mammon who keeps his heart. Between his devout amens he is thinking of the main chance. He can be converted and made religious. It is a great deal harder to make him honest. He is willing to sing the praises of the Lord, but he doesn't like to foot the bills. Amid the sorrow and bereavement of a stricken city, the American was true to himself. Those who had lost house and friends were asked to pay ten dollars for a carriage in which to follow the corpse to the grave. As about thirty victims of the storm were buried on Sunday, it may be inferred that the carriages in each procession were none too numerous. A sad sight was that of the four laundry girls and the chambermaid, all being borne together to their long home. Hardly less impressive was the burial at half-hour intervals of ten members of the IOOF, killed in Falls City Hall. It was a profitable day for undertakers. Nor did the officers of the Louisville and Southern Railroad forget their interests. They had for some time been desirous of regaining possession of their property controlled by the Monon route. This they did in the confusion, dismay, and darkness immediately following the storm. The writer does not wish to do any injustice to his people. Such items present but one side of the American's character. He is a strange mixture of grasping greed and warm-hearted generosity. The latter is an inborn trait, the former in drilled. We live in a rushing age. We are no more in a hurry about being rich than we are about a score of other things. Haste is a national characteristic. Further, our people are brought up with peculiar ideas of success in life. Everything is reduced to a basis of cold cash. A man may be learned, talented, industrious, but all these things are counted for naught if he is not also wealthy. So our young people are brought up to think that money-making is the one business of life, and as a result, the business world is full of those who resort to sharp practice and questionable methods, merely because they have been taught to subordinate honor and equity to gain-getting. Yet the warm sympathies and native generosity of our people are continually coming to the front, in a way that, in view of the other traits, is sometimes amusingly inconsistent. Men who will haggle almost about the price of a pin or make their living by wild or fraudulent speculation, nigh even professional gamblers or worse characters, are prompt in responding to the wail of a distressed city or state. After all, we are brethren. Yet our good and bad qualities are so thoroughly mingled that we must continually rob Peter to pay Paul. The American has another prominent trait, independence. He does not accept aid as such when he feels he can do without it. 
nor does he wait for demands of help when he hears of great misfortunes that have befallen his fellow countrymen. Lee Hunt once asked a very ragged and forlorn Irishman, why don't you ask for alms? Alms, is it? Sure, and isn't it begging I am with every bone of my body? The average American is generally quick to recognize a case that speaks for itself. To Louisville, in the hour of her calamity, came tenders of help from many quarters, and these offers would have been greatly multiplied had not the citizens declined the proffered assistance. They felt that the resources of the city were equal to the necessity. They were grateful, but self-reliant. End of chapter 6 Recording by Nancy Hollow.